Hello, welcome to your lecture on pneumonia. When you start to look at pneumonia, you realize that it gets very in-depth and very complicated as there's lots of different types of pneumonia. But what we're going to focus on today is a community-acquired pneumonia. And that's just basically a lower respiratory tract infection in a non-hospitalized person that's associated with symptoms of acute infection. There are about 5.6 million cases per year and it's much more common in those older than 65 who have HIV or immunocompromised in some way, who've been on recent antibiotic therapy or have resistance to antibiotics. Also those that have comorbidities such as alcoholism, uh, asthma, um, COPD, chronic renal failure, congestive failure, diabetes. And you'll see when we talk about uh, vaccinations on these people it's because they are at a higher risk. When we're talking about pathophysiology and pneumonia, we're actually talking about what's the underlying organism, so what's the etiology of this pneumonia, and based on what caused the pneumonia is going to uh, help our treatment plan. So we need to learn the potential organisms so that we can treat effectively. Now this is much simpler than it used to be because we used to try to learn all the different gram positives and gram negatives, but the guidelines that came out in 2007 basically saying this is the first line, try that, um, have them come back and make sure that it's working. If it's not, then let's do further investigation. So it's actually much easier. Okay, let's talk about prevention of community acquired pneumonia used to be that we gave one vaccine and now there are new recommendations to give uh, two vaccines. All adults over the age of 65 should receive the PCV13 and then you need to follow that by the PPSV23 six to 12 months later. The recommendations that we've always had for the PPSV23, sorry that's hard to say, they, they have not changed. So if you've learned those before, nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is this new addition, um, vaccination, the PCV13. And you have to be really careful how you give it. You have to spread it out. It has to be at least eight weeks apart. And they recommend that you do it six to 12 months later. So you could give one of the vaccines and then wait a year and give another. And then I've listed out everyone who um, is considered to be kind of high risk, but you can also find that information at the CDC. Don't forget about your influenza vaccine. Uh, all people over the age of 50 uh, get the vaccine. High risk persons, uh, 6 months to 49 years. Uh, children 6 to 23, healthcare providers. All chronic conditions uh, listed above in addition to pregnancy. And then you can give the live virus, uh, which is your nasal spray, to all healthy persons age 5 to 49 years. The clinical presentation of the patient can vary depending on the age as well as the type of pneumonia. Most of the time people are going to come in with cough. They're almost always going to have a fever, they're going to have fatigue, they're going to have chest discomfort. If it's classic community acquired pneumonia, they usually have sudden chills, followed by fevers, there's a productive cough, and there's pleuritic chest pain. If it's atypical, then they may have a sore throat, a headache, non-productive cough, and dyspnea. So there could be a little difference in the presentation. When it comes to pneumonias, I think knowing something about the different bacteria that cause it is extremely important. And that's because if you need to make treatment decisions other than what's first line, let's say first line is a macrolide, and you have a large population in your county who are resistant to um, Zithromax, then that may not be a good choice for you, but you need to know what the underlying a bacteria is so that you can make alternative choices. You'll probably see something on boards like what's the most common bacteria causing community-acquired pneumonia. 
These are risk factors for more uncommon bacteria that results in community-acquired pneumonia. This is definitely not something that I want you to memorize. Probably the big thing that I'd want you to be aware of is that with COPD, you're going to have a different treatment plan. Um, of course, with aspiration pneumonia, long-term residents, hospital-acquired pneumonia, those all require a different treatment, so just be aware of that. And then I probably want you to also be aware of the uh, hotel or cruise ship in the past uh, two weeks because you have to think about Legionella. There's an antigen that we can actually test for that, but you're going to have to tease that out in history before we can know that. And there's a little bit of a different treatment, so just be aware that that is uh, important. And also, if we think about um, whooping cough, then we need to have a different treatment. So think about those things. These are your non-bacterial or atypical organisms, and I'd had the hardest time when I first started trying to learn pneumonias about, I don't understand what atypical is, I don't understand what non-bacterial is, I don't understand how a pneumonia can be viral, so just don't get too wrapped up in that. There's basically the non-bacterial are basically things that will not grow and show on a gram stain. They may ex have the same treatment plan but they are called non-bacterial because they do not um, test out in the laboratory. So that's what that's about. Don't get wrapped up in that. It took me a long time to actually figure that one out. Differential diagnosis, and this is a little off, but once you actually have your diagnosis of pneumonia, then these are the different things and types of pneumonias and lung infections that you need to consider. Now when it comes to just differential diagnosis, when you walk in the room kind of differential diagnosis, you're going to think about bronchitis, you're going to think about asthma acerbation, you're going to think about COPD acerbation, you're going to think about influenza. So all of those things are really your common differential walking into the room. Once you've diagnosed pneumonia, then these are the things that you need to think about. Now, it's much easier that we have a treatment plan that kind of includes everything together, and we don't have to separate each one out. So that's where this comes from with the differentials. For subjective data, there's a lot of information that you want to gather. The classic clinical presentation of community-acquired pneumonia is at least two symptoms of acute infection along with evidence of an acute infiltrate on your chest x-ray and also um, abnormal findings of your lung assessment such as altered breast sounds or rails. Specific symptoms that are related to community-acquired pneumonia are usually a new cough with or without sputum. You're also going to have patients who already have a chronic cough so they may have a change in the color of their respiratory secretions and we talk about this with the COPD uh, lecture. Chest discomfort and dyspnea. Other things with community acquired pneumonia that they may report are chills, fevers, myalgias, fatigue, abdominal pain, anorexia, and headache. Your elderly patients may be a little bit different. They may not have the classic symptoms. They're more likely to have anorexia altered mental status, sometimes history of falls, and usually they will have uh, some changes in their respiratory signs or symptoms. They're much more likely to have comorbidities, so you have to think about that. The other things that you want to think about are uh, over the age of 65. Do they have alcoholism? If they do, it could be um, your common S pneumonia, but it could also be Klebsiella, so that's something that you have to think about. Immunosuppression, you know, are they taking medications that could uh, increase their risk, such as corticosteroids? Have they be on, been on antibiotics in the last three months? So if they are, then that alters your treatment plan, so that's very important to know. With COPD, you may have a different organism, so you got a different treatment plan. And with HIV, you have to think about uh, TB, or pneumocystis, and those are going to be, of course, different treatment plans. So all of that information you need to get in your subjective data. 
Alright, with your objective data, you've got to do a great job here. You may have fever, you may have hypothermia, tachypnea, tachycardia, you need to check their pulse, you need to check blood pressure, respiratory rate, temperature, you need to look for any signs of dehydration, you need to look for cyanosis, you need to check for signs of other conditions and other problems, you need to check for signs of alcoholism, uh, signs of drug use, You need to focus on the chest. You need to do your oscillation. You need to listen for rails, zygophony, frematis, bronchial breast sounds. You need to do a percussion. It may reveal reduced tactile frematis and dullness if there's a pleural effusion. There may be an increase in frematis, which suggests consolidation. So all of these things are very important. With uh, erythema multiform, that may be indicative of mycoplasm pneumonia, so look for a rash. And if there's a lot of confusion, then think about Legionella. With your diagnostics, you want to do a chest x-ray. That's going to be pretty much for all your adults. I think you can diagnose pneumonia easily without it and chest x-ray is just an additional cost, but your guidelines say chest x-ray, so if I test you and want your tested on board, so you need to say chest x-ray. Regardless of my opinion, you want to do a pulse ox, and pulse ox, CBC, and CMP, those are optional kinds of things that you really want to do to help you determine how serious this is, especially with your CMP, because you're looking at your different chemistries, you're looking at your BUN and those sorts of things that help you make the decision. Now, if they're severely ill, of course, you're going to want to refer, but the things you're, that you're going to think about, of course, are getting uh, gram stain, blood cultures, CMP, CBC, and ABGs. And of course, ABGs are just going to be your severely ill, and hopefully you're going to have referred those people and are not going to be taking care of them acutely. So. Just think about what your normal diagnostics would be. All right, so who do you consider a chest x-ray? You don't want to get a chest x-ray on everybody that walks in that has uh, viral bronchitis. You want to really clarify who you're going to do an x-ray on. And you're going to look for patients who have at least one of the following abnormal vital signs. A temp greater than 100, a heart rate greater than 100, respiratory great, rate greater than 20, and any patient with at least two of the following clinical findings. Decreased breast sounds, crackles or rails, and absence of asthma. So those are going to be the people that you really want to do a chest x-ray on. When it comes to management, one of the very first things that you do is determine the severity. So if this is someone that you have chosen to manage on an outpatient basis, of course antibiotics are going to be the most important thing that you do. Hydration is extremely important. Have them drinking lots of water. Expectorants may or may not help. As long as they drink a lot of water, really the research has shown that that will help them the secretions as much as needed. We don't want to give them cough suppression. That is something that we tend to do in outpatient settings is give them something to, to suppress the cough, but really we want them to cough up the abnormal sputum. You can give them an inhaler that's going to open their lungs and it's going to help um, allow them to cough up what they need to so that is a better choice for them. They may need oxygen if they do then that may be an indication that they can't be managed on an outpatient basis and of course if you feel like the patient's not responding to therapy you can repeat your chest x-ray that would be in six weeks. If you have an abnormal chest x-ray you want to repeat it in six to eight weeks you want to make sure that the chest x-ray is clear because what happens lots of times is we miss uh, lung cancer. So if this is a smoker, just rechecking that and making sure that what you saw in the x-ray was actually only the pneumonia and not something else is, is a good idea. So how do you decide when you need to admit? How do you decide when you need to refer? There's lots of different um, things out there that help us make the decision. 
we look at advanced age, we look at comorbidities, we look at abnormal vital signs, we look at immunosuppression. One of the big tools that we use on a regular basis is called CURB-65. You're looking at confusion, uremia, respiratory rate, low blood pressure, and age uh, greater than 65. So the higher the score that they have on the CURB-65, the more likely they are to have some serious uh, problems. Clinical stability, and these are patients that you can manage without sending to the hospital. You know, if they have a temp less than 37.8, if the heart rate's not over 100, if their respiratory rate is less than 24, if their blood pressure is greater than 90 and their pulse ox is greater than 90, they're able to, to take oral intake and they have a normal men mental status exam and not confused, then that's probably a patient that you can manage on outpatient. You just need to watch them very closely and have them come back to the office. Uh, each day for a few days. Okay, community-acquired pneumonia. These are your treatment options. You want to start with a macrolide, unless there's some reason to suspect that uh, in your community that there's a lot of resistance. If there is, then you want to go with doxycycline. Of course, if they have any kind of allergy to a macrolide, you need to go with second option. The third option is what you're going to see used in clinical all the time, which is using a fluoroquinolone. And that is actually your third line option in a healthy adult. We're getting lots of resistance, and that's because we're overusing antibiotics, especially the fluoroquinolones, the respiratory fluoroquinolones. You're going to see it used, but that is the, not the correct uh, guideline. Okay, so older adults that have comorbidities, and of course most of them are going to have. Or if you have a young healthy person who just got off another antibiotic, if they just came off a Z pack, they're getting worse, then you need to uh, move into a different antibiotic. If they've had antibiotics in the last three months, then they're more likely to be resistant. But you start with the respiratory fluoroquinolone, which basically they're saying don't use Cipro, although I have seen Cipro used quite a bit uh, in practice. Or you can use a beta-lactam, beta which is a high dose amoxicillin or augmentin, plus you either combine that with a macrolide or doxycycline. So your cheapest option here, if they don't have any insurance, which is people that I deal with on a regular basis, would be a high dose amoxicillin, which we can get very cheaply for $4, and also doxycycline, which we can also get for $4. So either one of those is okay uh, for first line, and these would also be the patients that you'd want to see back. I know that I said see them back every day, but if you have a healthy young adult, you don't have to. But these are the patients that you want to make sure that your treatment plan is working well with. So do have them come back or have someone call, let you know that they're doing okay. At least have them come back at three days. Because if your antibiotic isn't making a pretty significant impact by day three, then there's a chance that you need to change your game plan maybe change your antibiotic or maybe consider referral at that point.